بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته This is the fourth part in our series of discussions on the ahadith that Al-Imam al-Nabawi has collected in his Arba'een and inshallah today we will be reflecting on the fourth hadith he states, Imam al Nawawi states, عن أبي عبد الرحمن عبد الله بن مسعود رضي الله عنه قال حدثنا رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وهو الصادق المسدوق إن أحدكم يجمع خلقه في بطن أمه أربعين يوما نطفة ثم يكون علقة مثل ذلك ثم يكون مضغة مثل ذلك ثم يرسل إليه الملك فينفخ فيه الروح ويؤمر بأربع كلمات بكتب رزقه وأجله وعمله وشقي أو سعيد فوالله الذي لا إله غيره إن أحدكم ليعمل بعمل أهل الجنة حتى ما يكون بينه وبينها إلا ذراع فيسبق عليه الكتاب فيعمل بعمل أهل النار فيدخلها وإن أحدكم ليعمل بعمل أهل النار حتى ما يكون بينه وبينها إلا ذراع فيسبق عليه الكتاب فيعمل بعمل أهل الجنة فيدخلها رواه البخاري ومسلم This hadith is narrated on the authority of Abdullah bin Mas'ud رضي الله تعالى عنه who said the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم and he is uh, the truthful and the one who is believed narrated to us Verily, the creation of each one of you is brought together in the womb of his mother for 40 days in the form of a seed. Then he is a clot of blood for a similar period. Then a morsel of flesh for, the sim for a similar period. Then there is sent to him an angel who blows the breath of life into him and who is commanded about four matters. To write down his means of livelihood, which means his rizq, his lifespan, his actions, and whether he will go to Jannah or Jahannam. By Allah, whom uh, other than him there is no God, verily one of you behaves like the people of paradise until there is but an arm's length between him and between it. And that which has been written overtakes him and he behaves like the people of Jahannam, and thus he enters it. And one of you behaves like the people of Jahannam until there is but an arm's length between him and it, and that which has been written overtakes him, and so he behaves like the people of Jannah, and thus he enters it. And this hadith is narrated by Imam Bukhari and Imam Muslim in their authentic collections. The hadith is narrated on the authority of Abdullah bin Mas'ud, who is one of the um, senior companions of the Prophet. He was one who accepted Islam at an early age and during the early stages of Islam in Mecca and spent a lot of time in the service of the Prophet and was known for his knowledge and for being from among the fuqaha or the scholars of the companions Now coming to the hadith, there are two main concepts that are discussed in this hadith the first is the stages of the development of the human being in the wombs of uh, his or in the womb of his mother and the second is qadr or divine decree or predestination one's destiny now regarding the first concept we find that the stages of the development of the human being in the womb of his mother is mentioned in various places of the quran and in some places in more detail than how it is described here. It's important uh, to understand whenever looking at these issues what the purpose of the Quran is, why the Quran was revealed to us, right? And the purpose behind the Quran's revelation is to be a means of guidance, to be a book of guidance, to guide humanity to the straight path, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, billahi min shaytan rajim kitabu la rayba hudal lil That that is the book uh, or this is the book within there is no doubt huda lil muttaqin it is guidance for the people of taqwa so the reason why allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the quran to us is that so we may, we may be guided through it to the straight path the purpose of the quran as al imam al-shatibi mentions as well the um, and others as well is not necessarily to teach us science 
That's not the reason why the Qur'an was revealed. It's not a book of science. That is not to say that the Qur'an does not contain scientific, scientific truths within it. It certainly does. And this here is an example of that. But that is not the objective of the Qur'an. It's not the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed it. Now, now here, keeping that in mind, here we find that when the Qur'an discusses the process in which the human being develops in the womb of his mother, it is something that is far beyond what the contemporary science, scientific knowledge was at the time. And that is an indication to us that the Qur'an is the truth and was the message of Islam is the truth and it was sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and there's a detailed research and study that has been done upon this or a study and research, let's say, that's been done upon this by Dr. Keith Moore for those of you who are interested in looking, looking into um, the understanding of or the scientific or a scientific analysis of how the Qur'an talks about the development of the human being. So that's the uh, the first concept. The second concept that is mentioned here is that of Qadr, right? That at 120 days following conception, there are four things that are written down regarding every human being. The first is his rizq, right? His livelihood. The second is his lifespan, how long he will live and when he will pass away. His actions, the actions that he will perform. And the fourth is whether he will go to Jannah or he will end up in Jahannam, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect all of us. Now, regarding um, this particular portion of the hadith, there are several questions that are commonly asked, right? And one of them is whether it is possible for one's destiny to, to change or not, right? As it is mentioned in the hadith that uh, Imam Tirmidhi narrates, rahimahullah ta'ala, that the only thing that changes one's destiny is dua. So in order to answer that question, in order to answer the question of whether or not it is possible for one's destiny to change, um, it's important to understand that among the components of the concept of a divine decree or qadr or predestination is or are the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is, which is pre-eternal and is not subject to change, right? Jalla Jalaluhu. And also among its components uh, is that which is written in the Lawh al mahfuf right? That which is written, or in this case, as we see, that which is written by the angel. Now that which is written on the Lawh, or that whatever is written by the angel is a creation, right? It's not the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is pre-eternal and not subject to change. That which is written by the angel, or that which is preserved on, on the Lawh, are a creation, and therefore it is possible for them to change. So it is possible for one to make dua, and initially it is written for him that he will live a certain amount of time. And because of that dua, that time is then extended and he lives longer, right? It is possible for that to occur. However, this does not mean that there is any, any change that takes place in the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Since Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's knowledge is pre-eternal and not subject to change, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala pre-eternally knew that initially a certain lifespan would be written for such individual. And he would make dua and, uh, uh, at such point in his life, and following that point, his lifespan would increase. Now, so it is possible for, for fate to change to a certain extent, but the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not change. Another common question that is asked regarding this particular hadith is that the way the hadith could be understood, um, it could potentially mean that we are compelled in our actions. Right, that one is doing good, and as the Prophet ﷺ says, that verily one of you behaves like the people of paradise, until there is but an arm's length between him and it, meaning he has almost reached paradise, and then that which has been written overtakes him, and he behaves like the people of Jahannam until he enters it. So one could potentially understand this hadith to mean that we are compelled in our actions, that even if we try to do that which is good, whatever is written will eventually take over and that's where, that's where we will end up. But in order to understand this concept, we have to um, look back at what we discussed in the previous hadith, in the second uh, part of our series, when we, when we spoke about the hadith of Jibreel. If you recall, we discussed in, that, in the explanation of that hadith that that which is written does not compel our actions, 
but rather that which is written is based upon Allah's knowledge of what we will choose with the capacity that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us, um, the choices that we will make with that capacity. So it's not that that which is written compels us to do that which we will do, but rather the choices that we will make and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's foreknowledge of those choices, it is through His knowledge that our choices are uh, written prior to us actually performing them. And since our choices are, or the actions that we do are hinged on our choices, therefore we are held accountable for them. And that accountability is reasonable or perfectly just. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for guidance and tawfiq to always do that which is right and for him to allow us to purify our intentions in the actions that we perform. This concludes our discussion on the fourth hadith. Insha'Allah, we will continue tomorrow. Jazakumullah khairan. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh.